To understand how neurons communicate with one another, it is vital to understand the basics of synaptic transmission. The nervous system has billions of neurons, and each of them can have hundreds or thousands of contacts. These neurons are in constant communication, even when we're sleeping. This sheer amount of activity is truly remarkable. Despite this, neuronal communication is made possible by a couple different types of electrical signals, which are linked by chemical messengers. Let's zoom in for a closer look. Neurons have two important jobs. One is to transmit a message to a target across a synapse using neurotransmitters as messengers. The type of electrical signal resulting from this is called a graded potential. If the graded potential is the right size and type, then it allows the neuron to do its second important job, which is to carry the message along the length of its axon to its target using a type of electrical signal called an action potential. When an action potential reaches the axon terminals, it triggers, once again, neurotransmitter release, which continues the cycle of producing a graded potential and then action potential in the next targeted neurons. This continuous cycle of communication is running all the time in your nervous system. For this tricky topic, we'll focus on the events at the synapse and learn how synaptic transmission plays a role in neuronal communication. We're going to start our journey to the synapse with a bird's eye view. The axon terminals of the neuron on the left, shown here in red, form synapses with the dendrites of the neuron on the right. Although most neuronal axon terminals synapse on dendrites, like you see here, keep in mind they can also form synapses on other parts of the targeted neuron, such as the soma and the axon. The sending neuron on the left is referred to as the presynaptic neuron and the receiving neuron on the right is referred to as the postsynaptic neuron. Keep in mind, these are relative terms. Most neurons act as senders and receivers of information. So they're both presynaptic and postsynaptic, depending on which event we're referring to. Let's pick this particular synapse and zoom in for a little more detail. At this magnification, we can see little bubbles called synaptic vesicles. And inside these, we can see neurotransmitter molecules. These vesicles here are releasing their neurotransmitter contents into the synaptic cleft. Once released into the synapse, the neurotransmitters can travel the short distance to the postsynaptic neuron. Once they reach the other side, these neurotransmitters bind to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. There are lots of different types of receptors, but the simplest ones are gated to ion channels, like shown here. Once the neurotransmitter binds, it opens the ion channel part of the receptor, allowing certain ions to travel across the neuronal membrane along their electrochemical gradient. This influx of positive current in the form of positive ions is what generates graded potentials in the postsynaptic neuron. Thus, through the binding of postsynaptic ion channel receptors, synaptic neurotransmitters initiate postsynaptic graded potentials. Let's review the steps so far. First, neurotransmitter is released from the presynaptic terminal. Second, that neurotransmitter binds to receptors opening their ion channels on the postsynaptic side. What happens next in the postsynaptic neuron depends on the type of ion channel receptor that is activated, as different receptors are permeable to different types of ions. The type of ion channel receptor that is activated will then determine the type of graded potential that is initiated. If the channel opens and positive ions enter through the channel, then the inside of the neuron will become less negative. For example, the potential of the neuron might rise from its resting potential of minus 70 millivolts to minus 55 millivolts. This is referred to as a depolarization and is considered excitatory. If instead negative ions enter through the channel, then the inside of the neuron will become more negative. For example, 
the potential of the neuron might decrease from its resting potential of minus 70 millivolts to minus 90 millivolts. This is referred to as a hyperpolarization and is considered inhibitory. Let's look at some examples of different types of receptors which produce either excitatory or inhibitory graded potentials. First, let's look at depolarization. A neurotransmitter that is always excitatory at the synapse is glutamate. So, we can pretend that the orange diamonds are glutamate molecules, and the white circles in the synapse are sodium ions. When glutamate binds to its receptor, the channels open and sodium ions are driven by their electrochemical gradient to enter the neuron. When sodium moves into the cell through the receptor ion channel, it brings its positive charge with it, making the cell more positive, which is called a depolarization. If the channel remains open for longer, more sodium will flow in, making the cell even more positive. This type of graded potential is called an excitatory postsynaptic potential, or EPSP for short. What about hyperpolarization? A neurotransmitter that's almost always inhibitory at its synapse is GABA, and its receptor channel is permeable to negatively charged chloride ions, shown here as black circles. When GABA binds to its receptor, the channel opens and chloride ions are driven into the postsynaptic neuron because of their concentration gradient. When chloride moves into the cell through the GABA receptor ion channel, it brings its negative charge with it, making the cell more negative, which is called a hyperpolarization. If the channel remains open for longer, more chloride will flow in, making the cell even more negative. This type of graded potential is called an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, or IPSP for short. So, why does this matter? Well, if the postsynaptic neuron adds up all its EPSPs and IPSPs, and the membrane potential reaches a threshold of minus 55 millivolts, a different type of ion channel comes into play, one that is opened by a change in voltage. The ion channels we've learned about so far are opened by neurotransmitter binding, but these voltage-dependent sodium channels are sensitive to changes in charge. At resting conditions, say minus 70 millivolts, these channels are closed and sodium ions cannot pass through them into the cell. However, when the sum of all EPSPs and IPSPs raises the neuron's potential to or above minus 55 millivolts, the voltage-dependent sodium channels open, allowing sodium ions to flow into the cell. When these voltage-dependent sodium channels open, they create an action potential, which allows the neuron to send its message to its targets. Overall, synaptic transmission may seem quite tricky, but it's actually quite simple once you know the basics.